Good morning. Welcome to the level. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning. We've got to cover some of the announcements that are in your bulletin. You can see there that we are getting close to our annual picnic, which will be on August the 12th. Uh, this coming Tuesday at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we will be meeting to clean up the picnic woods. So if you are able to come and help uh, Luann and Charlie and, and everyone else uh, as we prepare for our picnic, is there anything else that people <coughs> need to bring Luann other than themselves? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, uh, Charlie's going to bring the the. Uh, Leaf blower to blow out all the leaves and stuff in there. So. Okay. Yes. Bucket in the room. Yeah. Bucket okay. in the room. Okay. And Patty's already cleaned the bathrooms, and Joey's been picking up the sticks and stuff in the woods, which I appreciate yeah. very much. Um, well, that's where you'll be tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So, so it shouldn't, it shouldn't take us too long if, if uh, enough of us come. Okay. Well, many hands make light work, and we appreciate the many hands so far. And uh, you'll also see there on the back of your bulletin, there are some, some things that we are collecting. Um, if you have uh, cups or glasses, small bowls, uh, sitting around your house that you're looking to get rid of, uh, the, We'll be looking uh, for those items for the coin toss. Also, if uh, you would like to provide baked goods, cakes, pies, cookies, breads, anything that you're good at baking and would like to donate it for the bake table, we'd appreciate that as well. And, uh, and also, um, any canned good items that you, if you're a canner, like my wife is an amazing canner, and I know that we have a, a list of a list of things uh, to can this week just for the picnic. So we are excited and, and getting ready uh, for the picnic as well. Just a reminder that next week um, the women's group will be meeting after worship. And then uh, you'll see there's little cards here for the Worcestershire Community Youth Group. If you have a, a, a neighbor or a grandkid and, and would like to invite them to grab one of these cards and, and hand it to them as a reminder that the churches here in Louisville are, are getting together and trying to form a youth group for our youth in our community, and we will be meeting at the Bonk Shack on the 6th, and the information is on that card. And also there is a clipboard that's being passed around, that it was passed around last week, uh, asking for it, those that are interested in a new members class slash if you'd like to to just have a refresher on what it means to be a Methodist and why we are who we are, uh, we will be starting that class in um, the end of August uh, into September. So if you could sign up if you're interested and just give me some days that work best for you and uh, we will decide then when the class will meet. Are there any other announcements? All right. No other pressing, pressing issues for this morning, so let us do what we have come here to do, which is to worship a risen Lord and Savior. So let us turn our hearts and minds over to God this morning as we quietly listen to the prelude and the light of Christ is brought into the sanctuary this morning.
join me in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, you have scattered your word among us. You have planted your seed, and now we ask that you use us to go and share the gospel. This morning we rise to worship you and to worship the fact that you loved us so much that you would send your son to die on the cross for us. That we may be dirt. That your word is planted in and may take root so that we may grow and be fruitful and go and share the good news with all we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as you're able and find in your hymnal, hymn number 79, as we sing, Holy God, we praise thy name.
please find in your hymnals on page 828 our Psalter reading for this morning, which comes from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 11. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name, make known God's deeds among the people. Sing to the Lord, sing your praises, tell all our God's wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Sing to the Lord in his strength, seek the Lord's presence continually. Remember the wonderful works God has done, the, mir the miracles and judgments that God has uttered. The lost strength of Abraham, God's servant, children of Jacob, God's The Lord is our God, whose judgments are in all the earth. The Lord is mindful of the everlasting covenant, the word of the man of the covenant made with Abraham, his promise sworn to Isaac and confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as a portion for our inheritance. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. You may be seated. <laughs> intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For those, gods for, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. And he will not also, along with him, freely give us all things. Who will bring any change against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is there to condemn us? For Christ Jesus, who died, and more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God. And he is interceding for us. Who? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor principalities, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither the height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Here ends the reading of God's holy word.
gospel lesson for this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 31 through 33, and also verses 44 through 52, and you can find it in your pew Bible uh, on page 14 of the New Testament. So as you turn there, just a reminder that we have been working through this 13th chapter of Matthew, which holds parables that Jesus uses to teach us about the kingdom of God. And we have covered the, the first two parables about the kingdom of heaven, and here at the end we get five more all in a row that are very brief. So we will begin in Matthew 13, verse 31 this morning. The parables of the mustard seed and the yeast. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of the plants in the garden, and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch on its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked through all the dough. The parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field when a man found it, he hid it again and then enjoyed, went and sold all he had, and brought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of, of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. And then the parable of the net. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up to shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. O oh, Heavenly Father, may the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. May your word be spoken and your word heard today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as I said over the past few weeks now, we have looked at the parable that the parables that Jesus uses to show us what the kingdom of God looks like. And we have been focusing on those parables so far about the seed, where God uses seed to, to teach us something. And often in these parables, we like to see ourselves in these parables. Often when when we read it, we will say, where do I fit in here? Where is Jesus pointing to me? And that's why I think parables work so well, because we can see us or see our lives or even see our world in what Jesus is teaching here in his word. If you recall, We started off with Jesus pretty much calling us dirt. 
we're all some type of dirt. And of course, we all want to be that good, deep, fertilizing dirt. The dirt that the seed falls amongst and it grows a great harvest. And then last week we looked at the weed and the wheat. Where the evil one has come after the sower has sowed his seed and the evil one comes and sows bad seed that is often indistinguishable between what is planted. And we see here this morning, even in the parable of the fish in the net, a similarity between the wheat and the weeds where Jesus is talking about the end of the age, where the angels will divide the good from the evil. A reminder that it is not our job here to try and separate ourselves, but to live, live good and faithful and fruitful lives, to allow our faith to be deepened. So the parables this morning began with the mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds that gardeners will use. And the mustard seed gives us this powerful image of the kingdom of heaven. Even though it's one of the tiniest seeds, seemingly it could be insignificant or even overlooked, the mustard seed will grow into this great big plant that is often referred to as a tree, where the birds will come and rest on it. The mustard seed represents the kingdom of heaven in its initial state appearing small and maybe even inconspicuous. Yesterday, we got to, to go with some other members of the church and, and uh, a, a bus full of people from around the area to go down to the Bible Museum. And, and it was a, a wonderful museum to, work, to walk through and we didn't get a chance to see it all. But it was amazing to me to see how the word of God spread from just a small, insignificant, really, area of the world. And how much work was done to continue that work, the word of God, to, to move and become a global book. There were those who risked their lives just so others could hear the word of God. It started with really a ragtag group of people in Galilee following this man named Jesus. And it grew into a church that changed the world. So this mustard seed does fit that description of what the kingdom of heaven looks like. It starts out small, but it sprouts into this great big plant. And the birds here that Jesus uses in the parable symbolizes God's oppressed people, that they may find refuge in this church, in this kingdom of heaven. One of the areas in the museum was this room you walked in and you saw Bibles in all the different languages. And there's a section of books, of bookshelves that are empty because those are languages that the Bible has not been translated into. And it's amazing because that section is bigger than the section where the entire Bible has been translated into. So the kingdom of heaven has a lot of work to be done here on earth. 
this image of birds finding refuge in this tree remind us of those that are in those countries that it is actually illegal to have the Bible translated in their language. It reminds us of these countries where people who believe in Jesus are persecuted, and yet they find refuge in the Word of God. They find refuge in God's kingdom. The kingdom of heaven welcomes all people, no matter their background or circumstances. The kingdom of heaven offers safe haven for those seeking rest and peace. Those willing to throw off the burden of sin and take up the cross of Jesus and be born again find refuge in the kingdom of heaven. So as we mark about the growth of the mustard seed into a tree, we can see parallels in our own lives and how God's kingdom can take, take root even in, within us. And how God's kingdom, kingdom can flourish among us. We are reminded of the parable of the soil and how the Holy Spirit is at work in us when we become Christians. It turns us into good soil that is good for growing and producing for some 30, some 60, some even 100 times that which was sown. Jesus teaches in these parables that are found here in Matthew 13 that the kingdom of heaven is changing the world. Like yeast, it only takes a little bit of God's kingdom to start working. And over time, it will really get into the culture and even corrupt cultural norms and, and empires. When we are part of the kingdom, our faith really permeates every part of our lives. It's not merely an external claim or a change, but a complete transformation of our hearts and minds and our actions. Just as dough rises and expands because of the yeast, so does the influence of the kingdom of God in our lives when we, when we embrace it fully. The kingdom of God really shapes our character. It begins to shape our relationships and the way that we even interact with the world around us. The kingdom of, of heaven makes us want to jump at the chance to be in community with other believers, to worship with other believers. Is there anyone here other than myself who got up and was excited to come to church this morning? It's okay if you said you didn't, but I get excited for Sunday morning because we get a little glimpse of what it's like to be in heaven, surrounded by loved ones, surrounded by, by believers. An excitement that we get to worship a risen Lord and Savior. We get to do something in this place that many people in the kingdom of heaven around the world don't have an opportunity to do. The kingdom of God brings positive change to the world. It brings positive change to our lives and to those that are gathered here with us. The kingdom of heaven is that hidden treasure or the pearl. It is a treasure that we only get one chance to receive. And we should be willing to give all that we have. Even selling off all of our possessions so that we can receive it. 
That makes coming to church for an hour or a week doesn't seem too bad, does it? But God is asking more from us. He's asking something that many of us will find difficult, to go and sell everything you have. Just so you can be in the kingdom of heaven. So that you can share this with others, so that they may come into the kingdom as well. The kingdom of heaven entered this world as a small seed. Really, Jesus entered the world at the humblest of all beginnings as a baby, just like we did. And that small seed has taken hold of many people's lives. It has changed the hearts and minds of people. It has become a worldwide church. It has changed civilizations. And it has spread from the town of Galilee and Nazareth and Israel to go around the globe and into places where it is not even welcome and yet it continues to grow. It is made up of people from every nation. It is like that fishing net that is gathering all kinds of people. The kingdom of heaven doesn't necessarily look like we do. The kingdom of heaven is a great and diverse group of people that are strong in their faith. It emphasizes God's all-encompassing love and desire for everyone to be part of the kingdom. So what else has had that great of an impact on our world? An impact where it has changed even the way that we count time. It is our task to allow ourselves to be used by God and to allow <coughs> His Spirit to deepen our faith. To prepare for the end of the age when God will separate the good fish from the bad fish. The weed from the wheat. When we have the love of God, what can separate us from his kingdom? As Jerry said, that passage in Romans can be read every day. And it is often used as a reminder by people on, on sports teams and even in business and in our own lives. What can separate us from the love of God? Paul proclaims that magnificent truth of God's love demonstrated through Jesus Christ. He highlights that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, showcasing the depth of God's love and grace. You know, there is a song that is called Reckless Love by Corey Asbury. Maybe you have heard it before. And when it came out, there was, it really split people into different opinions because the question was, is it, is it really correct theology to say that God's love is reckless? And you might find yourself on one side or the other of the debate, as it probably is with a lot of things in our world. We like to choose sides. And I have to say, I, I was guilty too, because when, when it first came out and I listened to it, I thought, man, God's not reckless. You know, <clears throat> reckless describes a behavior or an action characterized by a lack of concern. 
or not thinking of the potential consequences or dangers that are, are involved. When I think of reckless, I think of my brother Matthew, who was always a daredevil and was willing to do anything and probably out of all of us had seen the emergency room more than, than us maybe all combined. But there was just something in him that just makes him that way. So I thought, God can't, can't be reckless, can he? Does God disregard the rules? But you know, God doesn't, God's love doesn't fit in a box. I have grown to like that song, Reckless Love, when I listen to it. Because God's love is extravagant. It is all-consuming, and it's all, it is undiscriminating. God's love pursues us wherever we are. God isn't here trying to woo us as a romantic love interest might, right? And we might move on if it didn't work out. God's not that way. God's not trying to make us feel good and, and really sometimes God's word does offend us a little. But if we look at the love of God, he is willing to go where we are. Even if that means that we are at the very bottom and we've hit rock bottom. God is willing to to lead the 99, to pursue us. He doesn't say, well, that person, they quit coming to church or, you know, they're doing drugs or they're an alcoholic. Oh, maybe someday they'll come around. When Jesus is there next to that person, Calling to them. They're with them. God is with us through our struggles. God doesn't think about what it looks like to love us. God doesn't think about are we loving the right person? God doesn't think about well, is that person a good Methodist? or a good Catholic, or a good Lutheran, or a good non-denominational person. God's love pursues us. God wants us to be in that relationship with Him. And so what does God's love do? It sends his son to die. That is how far God's love is willing to go. To death. And so if we put that in our human perspective, we would say that God's love is pretty reckless. Certainly we might go the extra mile to help somebody. We might encourage them to come to church or we might talk to them about our faith we might even offend them by pointing out sins in their lives just as the word points out sins in our own lives but I would bet most of us would probably draw the line at dying for someone at dying for people who may never Accept what Jesus did. And yet that's what God's reckless love does. Jesus looked at all the sins in the world. Not just the, the sins of believers. Of all the world. And Jesus said, It is worth dying for. 
that hope and salvation that we have in Christ is worth it. Through Christ's sacrifice, we are reconciled to God. And our sins are forgiven. This really is an unmerited favor which exemplifies God's boundless love which invites us to enter into a restored relationship with him. If God is willing to pursue us to the end of the world, even to the death, then we should be willing to give all that we have to pursue him. We should be willing to sell all that we have to give of our time and of our possessions so that we may be obedient and say, okay, God, here I am. Use me. There should be a daily call as Christians in our lives. Not, here I am when I'm available, God. Use me then. Here's my schedule for the next six months. If you could just work in a sprinkling or two of miracles and and um, I'll, I'll, and answer some of my prayers, certainly you will work into my life that way. That is the passion, really, that Paul is emphasizing here. He is saying that nothing can separate us from God. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Not tribulation, not disease, not distress, not persecution, not even death can separate us from God. Man, does that make you excited to come to church on Sunday morning. I mean, it just amps me up and gets me ready to go. I hope you can tell. God's love is steadfast. God's love is unchanging. God's love is providing us with hope and assurance even through life's trials. <sighs> now, having covered over the past three weeks the parable Jesus, the parables that Jesus used to describe the kingdom of heaven, do you understand all of this? I love how Jesus ends the teaching of these parables to his disciples. He uses seven parables to describe the kingdom of heaven, and then here you'll see in Matthew 13, verse 51, what is the disciples' response to Jesus' question of, have you understood all of this? It's a simple one. And it's very much telling of who the disciples are. They say, yes. Right? When I read it, that's what I see. It's kind of like a meager, meekly, yeah, sure. And isn't that how we are as humans? You know, when I taught Sunday school to, to children and to, to youth, the high school students used to always just give me the answers that they, they thought I wanted to hear. And oftentimes I would say, do you agree with that? And they would just say, yes. I think it's hard to answer yes to that question because it is hard for our human minds to really comprehend what the kingdom of heaven is. To really understand what the love of God is. So it's okay you just sit there and just nod your head and say, yeah, I, I get it. But I know some days Many days, I don't get it. But we can be encouraged by these parables 
and the message of God's unfailing love in Romans. So as we embrace the kingdom of heaven and its transformative power, may we surrender all to Jesus. Not just a little bit, but all. Let us recognize the immeasurable worth of God's kingdom. A kingdom that is worth giving up all that we have and selling our properties and our wealth so that we may obtain the kingdom of God. As we journey through life, let us stand firm in this assurance that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even our own stupidity. I know we pray it every Sunday, but let's mean it when we say, May his kingdom come and his will be done. Not only in heaven, but on earth. In your life. In my life, in the life of this church, and throughout the world. And with that I say, come Holy Spirit, come. Amen. And amen. <clears throat> now let us lift up our joys and concerns this morning and be reminded of the love that God has shown us through his heavenly kingdom. Let us pray together. Dear God, I pray for each person here, both in this room and watching online. I just pray that they are willing to give it all up so that your love may shine through their lives. May they lay the burdens of their sins down at the cross daily and pick up their cross. Make in them good dirt so that the word of God may be heard and spoken bring up and produce a great bountiful harvest. Through each one here, may we go and share the gospel so that the kingdom of heaven continues to expand. That this church continues to grow and be known as a church that shares the word of God that shares the love of Christ, that shows the world the gospel. I give you thanks and praise this day for each one who is here and who is watching. For those who are servants of God, the Most High. And Lord God, we lift up these joys to you this morning. The joy of new baby chickens. The joy of Jean and Ken celebrating their 66th wedding anniversary on the 27th of July. The joy that cooler and breezy mornings bring. The joy of being part of church family and we give you thanks and praise for the women's ministry and the fellowship that they have here and for all those who are working hard to, to bring about our annual picnic may it be a, a successful fundraiser for our church but most of all, let it show our community that we have the love of Jesus Christ.
And Lord God, we pray for all those who are hurt, who are broken, and who are dealing with illness and, and the loss of loved ones. We lift up all of our concerns to you this morning. And we pray for Cheryl Anders, Bob and Gloria Eves, Scott, Frank, Corey and Liz, Trey, Clyde Domer, Nancy, and Jenna. We lift up the family of Lucas, and we pray for the family of Ashley Klein. We pray for Shirley Fishak. We lift up Joe and Marita McIntyre. Ann, for Rocks, Robert Jr., Stan, Ann, Joanne, Stephanie. We lift up Jim, and we lift up Pam, and Don Simmons, John Wolf, John Baker. And we lift up those who are not with us here today because they were traveling and spending time with loved ones. And we lift up those things that are on our hearts that worry us. Those things that often we only share with you, Lord. You know our fears and our anxieties and we just pray that you release us from those. That you see us through. That your love prevails even in the face of death. Even in the, the face of depression or loneliness. Lord, I lift up all those who are missing loved ones. And we pray for their comfort. We pray for those that we are helping to grieve. Lord God, you give us the strength to face all of these trials and tribulations because we are part of your heavenly kingdom. We have seen the love of Jesus at work in our lives. And we give you thanks for that. Now let us remember his love by praying the prayer that he taught us to pray by praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> now I would invite you to stand as you are able and join in singing hymn number 540. I love thy kingdom more. Thank mm -hmm. you.
blessing. It's not every Sunday that I get up here and I feel like down in this hall. But I come pretty close this morning. Because when I talk about the love of God, it is exciting. It fills me up and I hope it fills you up. Because God looked at me, a sinner, and said, he's worth it. And he looked at you, a sinner, and said, you are worth it. So that should be enough to excite us, to pump us up for the week, and to let us depart from this place to go and share that kind of love, which is a little bit reckless. So go, church, and be reckless with your love. Show it to all you need, no matter who they are. In Jesus' name we pray. Go in peace. Thank